to the question and answer period of the night. Hello, I'm Ian Wolfe. I produce Diffusion Science Radio, a weekly science and technology podcast. All these people have been interviewed for the podcast, so you can hear them again saying things in a conversational way. But if you've got questions that you've been thinking about and wondering since you've been listening to all these amazing talks, this is going to be your opportunity to ask those questions. So Fred will have somebody come around with a microphone and he'll point to people and you'll get your chance. So before I go to the audience, I've been asked to just ask a few little questions to sort of seed things. So going in the order here that we spoke, John, yeah. um, I want to ask you, do you think there could be a, another foundational extrapolation big mistake in biology that's just gone? People assume something like they did with junk DNA that they could extrapolate from bacteria and they didn't question it and then when people did, they didn't listen. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's another big mistake like that? Inevitably. <laughs> Inevitably. Uh, you know, I was saying to someone earlier that there's an apocryphal, probably untrue story about Lord Kelvin, who in the 1890s reputed to have predicted the end of physics. He said, we've got Boyle's law, we've got Ohm's law, you know, it's all over. We've done that, folks. And of course, then came, along came Rutherford and Einstein and, and Schrodinger and threw all the cats up in the air. <laughs> plate tectonics, continental plate tectonics, was ridiculed for half a century um, until the penny dropped, you know. So the mistake that science makes over and over again is to, to think that it has the conceptual framework correct rather than thinking that uh, it may well and usually is incomplete in some facet that wasn't expected. So I don't know what it is, but I, you know, I, I think science, and most of my, most of science is, is, is what, um, now the chap uh, who wrote uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions um, Thomas Kuhn in 62, he, he portrayed science as lurching, that's my word, from paradigm shift to paradigm shift, between which people did what he called normal science. So they designed their investigations and interpreted their results within the reigning conceptual framework until anomalies occurred. And the anomalies would be ignored until they accumulated to such a level that people said, hey, we've got something wrong here. It's usually not wrong, it's just incomplete. And you could think of Newtonian to Einstein in physics, or, uh, you know, or Ptolemaic to um, Copernican astronomy. So um, what, I, what I try and instill in my students is curiosity and to really question things that don't make sense to them. Now, it's often because they don't know enough, but I said, look, follow your nose. But you get to a point, and the more you learn as a PhD student or a postdoc, you move towards the front of the bus. And you get to the front, and it still doesn't make sense, and you know you've got something. And I like a quote from Leonard Cohen. Um, you know, the cracks are where the light shines in. Very good. And so, Renee? Yeah. Ask me. You mentioned about an indirect way to detect coronavirus with these extracellular vesicles. So the question is, do viruses not put out their own extracellular vesicles? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And we have discussed this with my good friend, Nathan, but they're about the same size as extracellular vesicles and their structure is a lot more simpler. So they could, and we wouldn't mind looking, but we reckon it would be more beneficial to go for the extracellular vesicles that come from infected cells. Um, not only for detection, but also for the fundamental knowledge. Uh, at the end, I'm always going to be a researcher. I don't care about fundamental uh, commercialization, and my IP department at the university will hate me for that. <laughs> they do already because I say it all the time. But yeah, so it's more the fundamental knowledge that we get from the pathway to get to the commercialization is what I'm interested in. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we'll pass them along. So, Kate, I wanted to ask you, I was very interested in the leaking of the glass that holds nuclear waste and that we might be able to improve things. Is this something that Ansto knows anything about? Yeah, so we've had uh, a, 
a few discussions with ANSTO, um, and they're certain, they certainly think it's worth doing. Of course, Australia doesn't currently have large amounts of nuclear waste. It's a much bigger problem at the moment in the US, where they have a, a site called Hanford that has, I don't even know how much, huge numbers of drums that are, you know, getting a bit leaky. Um, and they've, you know, had to change the pH to try and stop them from corroding on the inside. So they used to be acidic and now they're really alkaline. Um, it's a much bigger problem in other places in the world, but the more that we start thinking about changing energy sources, about using nuclear um, engines to power things like submarines, then the, the more important it's going to become. Fantastic. And Richard, I don't know if your 10 minutes has passed, <laughs> but did you work out how to successfully play Guess My Number? Yes. It's all totally clear in my head now. Please tell us. I might need to draw some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that game basically allows you to um, develop different search strategies. So you've got a thing which takes a number and says true or false, and then maybe you're trying to find the first number for which that thing becomes true. Okay? So it's like, okay, I'll, I'll go, I could ask, is it true for one? And if it is true for one, you say the answer is one. And then you could say, is it true for two? And if it's true for two, then you can say the answer is two. Now, there are other search strategies, right? So I could just keep going up from one, two, three, four, five. But another search strategy would be to like bisect. So I've got 10 things. So I say, is your number five? And then if they say no, then you say, is your number seven? And so then you kind of go up or down, right? And so, so the point is that different strategies for this game would implement different search strategies for playing guess your number or something like that. And so just starting from this very simple thing, I guess, I mean, you can see it on the page, it's not super hard, right? And just within that, there's enough, there's enough richness to encode all these different kind of quite complicated and subtle computer programs for doing something as useful as kind of implementing a search strategy or something like this. Thank you. So now we turn to the audience, and we've got one over here. Who's, we didn't do it. Oh, do you want to take that one or this one? <laughs> take your pick. Take your pick, <laughs> take one, Thank and you. I'll pass it along to whoever. Hi, Professor John. Um, you said that muscles, bones, etc., they are programmed during the conception. When you say that, I'm wondering, what about before conception, when the, um, they are still in sperm and ovum. Why not? Uh, because we do pick up that mother straight and father straight, that bone structure and all those things. Why not before conception and what happens? Thank you. Okay. That's a very good question. And um, I was just trying to think how to answer it. There is a lot of evidence that there is transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. In other words, we inherit both the hardwired stuff in our DNA, but softwired stuff, which turns out to be RNA mediated. And it's, it's, called, it's Lamarckian. So uh, Lamarck, who um, wrote a century before Darwin, actually invented evolution. Darwin didn't. What Darwin did was give a plausible mechanism for how it works. And Darwin said that he didn't mind what Lamarck said because he didn't know what caused the variation upon which selection acts. So Lamarck, you know, was the sort of stretching giraffe neck sort of thing, you know, use of a particular feature, you know, was... And the theoretical biologists in the 1930s ruled out Lamarckian inheritance when they tried to integrate Mendelian genetics with Darwinian evolution. And they said all mutation is random, which is incorrect, but they just ex cathedra said that. And they said that uh, Lamarckian type inheritance of experience didn't exist. Again, ex cathedra experiment. Then there was a bizarre experiment quoted where they mice, mice tails were chopped off for five generations and didn't change the length of the tails in the next generation. So they said, aha, you know, there's no memory of experience. You know, when I talk about this, the students, I hop across the stage like, you know, three blind mice getting a tail chopped off, you know, stupid. So that became law uh, with no evidence whatsoever. However, in, and I won't go too long, too long 1915, an English geneticist called Bateson um, reported what he called bizarre patterns of inheritance, rogue patterns of inheritance, he called it, which was the first observation of what later became called paramutation, 
which has been really well described in plants because you can do the genetics at high resolution. There's no question that both uh, the experience of plants for you know, stresses or environment is transmitted to the next generation and it's RNA mediated. The same thing happens in, in animals, but the extent of it is unknown because it's very hard to test because the genetics is much more difficult. But a clue comes from tomatoes, of all things, um, where the transgenerational epigenetic inheritance is mediated by what are called microsatellites, which are the things that you use for DNA fingerprinting in humans. And we've got about a million of them. And there's um, a lot of evidence now that we are, um, from studies in mice as well as humans, that we are um, inheriting some degree of memory. Now, the extent of which we don't know, um, if we take the clue from plants, it's probably RNA mediated through eggs and sperm. Some of the molecules are starting to be identified, but it's early days. And, you know, it's one of those examples where people just made an assumption which turned out to be wrong. So we are the product not only of DNA, but also our parents' experience in some fashion, particularly probably with neuropsychiatric issues, things. And that probably explains the missing genetic variation in the genome wide association studies, if you're familiar with that. So I hope that's not too complicated, but that's the story. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay. And oh, we've got one over here. It's like a microphone. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I just have a question for Professor Mike. Because I already asked you this question before, but I um, just want to reiterate it and uh, hopefully give you more details. So, from my understanding is that for, because you emphasized on the enhanced RNA in regulating mm. the genomes, the human gene expression and the, the whole genetic uh, organisms. Mm. So, my question is for RNA to happen, you need to, they need to be transcribed from DNA and that require very complex protein transcriptions of the RNA. So, at the point of conception, where did those proteins come from and how they get passed on? Like, is it from the parents or yeah. from the environment? Yeah. So um, the, the quick answer is that the, the egg, the ovum, which is a very large cell, and the sperm is just a bullet of DNA, uh, <coughs> is uh, pre-programmed with all of the essential proteins required to initiate the first round of gene expression in the zygote or the, you know, the, um, a couple of extra points. It's very important that that is asymmetric. So in, in mammals, the point of sperm entry into the egg creates a, um, a, an asymmetry. So that when the first cell division takes place, you get different on one side and the other. Uh, and you can't get proper um, development without this asymmetry in, in cell division. Another quick comment I make is to follow Kate's analogy with Lego parts, which I should have mentioned. I mean, a very good way of thinking about the way we are programmed is the proteins are our Lego parts, the, the, the enzymes, the structural proteins, etc. And whether those Lego parts are um, put together to form a house or a castle depends on the complexity of the plants. So Lego parts for animal development are pretty constant all the way from worms up to us. Now there's some differences, new proteins in the brain, etc. But um, the, it's the pla architectural plants that get more and more sophisticated with a relatively constant set of component parts. So, and that wasn't your question, but it, I think it's a very good and simple way of thinking about, you know, our programming. There's parts and there's, you know, architectural plans. Thank you. Got one here. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, following on from your com oh, following on from your comments, John, <laughs> Um, else when I went to school uh, <laughs> and I first learnt chemistry, I thought, oh, this is all Lego with atoms. Yeah. And that's what it feels like. But my question is actually for Kate. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a bit of a simpleton when it comes to things like that. And, and the more I learn about chemistry, the more it occurs to me that chemistry is just geometry. And that's all it is. What am I missing if I make that assumption? Oh, <laughs> some of it is geometry, absolutely. Um, you know, every 
if I think about a carbon atom, for example, and how it forms bonds, those bonds are in a particular geometry, which is tetrahedral. So, it's, you know, you, you can't make a structure that doesn't have that tetrahedral shape from a carbon atom. Um, but I would say there's a whole lot more complexity other than just the shape of the molecules. So I could make the same shape molecule from different atoms and it would have quite different properties. Yeah, but the, the molecular <coughs> reactions are all geometrical relationships between the different shapes of the molecules. The, uh, certainly in biology, things line up geometrically yep. and we have lock and key structures. And it, it, it occurs to me that everything is just more Lego with atoms. Absolutely. It's all gov if you're making a new molecular structure, it's governed by the geometry of the orbitals on the atom. So the directions that those orbitals point is where the bonds form, because that's where the electron and density and the is. the chemical properties of what you've made are determined by, by geometry. Yeah, absolutely. So all, and in the end, it's all geometry. <laughs> I think it's more complicated than that, but it's definitely a lot of geometry. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Uh, we've got one way over it's here. It's really what we, call, what we in Sydney call a finger on that question. You know what the <laughs> Sydney philosophers say. Um, though it would have been good if we'd had a professor of audio engineering tonight who, <laughs> who asked for no feedback. Right? <laughs> in any case, I'll hold the microphone way down here, I think, um, to lead on to this question because I, 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 you, you often see these... Is it not? Am I too far away? No, no, you're good. Okay. okay. Um, but when we do this kind of modelling, where you have the microtubules and the little robot walking along, you see the trouble. The thing that I think when I see that, I think that's really very interesting. But it's like that we we understand how a mechanical watch works, and then we just sort of scale down and we make this little robot thing. But surely. Um, when we look at our watch, our mechanical watch, we don't think of fields, we only think of substances. And so we just scale down and, and but what about the fields that, like very tiny electrical fields because they're ions after all, so there are ionic fields. So you're bringing the substance closer, the, these little objects are closer to the, and so, well, um, which has the priority, but uh, you know, surely there's much more than that kind of, um, Euclidean geometry going on there, and the, how do the fields um, affect what we really think about there? It's on. It's on. I'm just going to say yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's much more complicated than just geometry. I think that was my answer already. Um, but yeah, look, the 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 electric fields, the magnetic fields that you know, circling electrons make magnetic fields as well. There's a whole pile of of other factors that we have to think about. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's just that, that it, it kind of um, warps our concepts when we just scale the mechanical bits, do you know what I mean? And we see this on the screen and we think, oh, okay, at that level, it's just like a watch, but it's smaller. It's so simple, but it's just yeah. tiny. Yeah. yeah. But it absolutely isn't because if it was that simple, we wouldn't have to spend decades in That's the lab right. trying to do it. Yeah, okay. And I should hold the microphone further away. That's right. <laughs> That's good. Somebody else? Do you want to bring it around? Oh, you oh, already no, had a question. Pass it over. Yeah, 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 somebody else. I'll, I'll yeah. take the microphone. Let's <laughs> yeah. have a look. So, so we've got anyway. somebody else yeah. over here. Would you like to... We used to have someone run around. Uh, a question for Richard, which is, could be a dumb question. Okay. You mentioned that chess is incredibly difficult to, mm -hmm. what, what's the word, to put into a, uh, into a computer game. And there was one more that was even more complicated. Is there a, um, an equivalent in biology? Take, for example, the chemical molecules or the, uh, the DNA, RNA. Mm -hmm. Are people applying computational game theory to these complex chemical or biological reactions. And I'm saying it because one of the first applications of quantum physics, when the quantum computer actually turns up, will be to design new molecules, for example, or to understand the, the basis of many biological reactions. So 
does your work translate into that area? And if not, is it possible for it to? So I guess there are two different things that we can consider here. So one is playing more and more complicated games. And so indeed, I mean, I guess the way in which that has been done more recently, so I mean, I talked about Go and how that had only recently uh, computers surpassed humans in playing Go. And so that was done using convolutional neural networks. And so, um, I mean, the basic underlying technique is a technique that's been used for very long called Monte Carlo tree search. So that's basically a technique for saying, I don't know the entire game tree, but I'm going to try and find the best strategies I can from this point without knowing all possible outcomes, only seeing a limited distance into the future. But what was new was mating that to convolutional neural networks and using that to train the, the Monte Carlo tree search. So those techniques, have, um, I mean, so convolutional neural networks are now being very widely applied in, I guess, biology and areas like that. Um, the kinds of games I'm studying are very small. I mean, they're as small as the things you saw on that screen there, right? And they don't get very much bigger. They can get, I mean, I'm a mathematician. When I say they're small, I mean they're finite. And when I say, and when something's finite, the game of chess is small to a mathematician, right? But the games I'm looking at typically are really quite small. And so in that sense, um, you're, and as I say as well, you're not really studying them to win them. You're studying them to gain a better understanding of fundamentally what's going on when you do a certain kind of computation. So you're kind of trying to uncover some hidden combinatorics or structure behind just the very act of computation, which is not obvious. I mean, you just, you write a computer compiler or something and it sort of goes off and does stuff. And you're like, great, everything works the way it's supposed to. But you say, what's actually going on behind that? And so that's what we're trying to investigate with this game theory. So I guess it's the same technique could be used sort of towards biology, but the particular applications I have in mind pull away from that, I guess, because of the other desiderata we have. Um, Richard, you gave us um, three possible responses to the question, uh, do you want my number? Yes, no, and here's the number. <laughs> I'd just like to know what ramifications would occur if you added, I don't know, as a response. So this, this is actually quite, a, uh, quite an important thing to do. So in, in computation, a very important aspect is just failing to finish, OK? I mean, it's sort of the basis of, of, uh, of computation theory is that sometimes your computations don't finish. And in a sense, I don't know. The way a computer would encode that is you just sort of sit there and don't give an answer. Right. And so this is really important. And so it's about not playing to the end of the game. At some point, you might just decide to give up. Or you might do something more interesting, which is to sort of continue to loop over and over, asking the same question over and over again and never, never finishing the game. And so this is a very important aspect of it, and it's to do with um, the difference between programs that always terminate and programs that only sometimes terminate. And the latter are really important, and they're necessary to get a kind of completely general notion of computation. So that, that might make games more interesting. It does. It makes them much more interesting, okay. yeah. Hi. This is a general question for everyone. Um, how's AI impacting your business and... Uh, in the future, what you believe in? Do you want to start, Richard? Um, OK, yeah. At the moment, so I mean, OK, there are two things that might impact. One is my research, and one is my teaching. And it's definitely having a big impact on my teaching. But for my research, at the moment, the ability of computers to do mathematics is quite limited. So what they can do very well is they can follow techniques and recipes, quite advanced techniques and recipes. So when I talk about my teaching, ChatGPT can do a pretty creditable attempt at undergraduate and mathematics assessments. Um, however, they can't go anything beyond that. There's no scope for original thinking. They basically can regurgitate existing formulas, but what you're doing in mathematics is trying to create original thinking. And that's not necessarily possible. Where they are very useful is in computational aspects. I don't, so I talked about computation, but 
in the actual kind of mathematical structures I study, I'm not doing computation. However, there are a lot of people who are doing that kind of thing. So uh, Jordi Williamson at the University of Sydney is, has a big project to use AI to help solve problems in representation theory, and they are very heavily computational problem. Um, and so there have been recent breakthroughs in kind of reducing the number of operations to perform very basic mathematical um, computations like things called uh, taking determinants of matrices and things like this, so, and multiplying matrices. So these things, which are very, very basic operations, they find more efficient ways to do that using AI. So there are definitely computational aspects for people who are doing computational algebra or something like that. But for the kind of math I'm doing where you're actually just trying to think up new arguments, it doesn't really impact very much, I think, at the moment. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think in, uh, in chemistry, AI has already been used to uh, look at developing new molecular uh, metal organic frameworks. So there's a, a whole realm of chemistry called metal organic frameworks that looks at building sort of big architectures uh, which are used to store hydrogen gas and try and track carbon dioxide and all of these sorts of things. And there's a whole project going on at the moment to try and use AI to make better metal organic frameworks. And the predictions are now being tested in the lab. So um, that they're not silly predictions, they're, they look reasonable. Um, there are programs going on looking at, you know, when you, when you do a chemical reaction and you're trying to, to make a new bond between two molecules, there are lots of factors that you need to optimize, you know, time, temperature, solvent, rate of stirring, and AI is being used to try and help optimize a lot of those things. And I think on top of that, the machine learning aspects, so not the sort of chat GPT models, but the machine learning aspects are going to be very powerful in terms of, in my field, predicting what the molecular structure should look like to bind to a sulfate ion. Um, I can make, you know, 85 molecules and one of them will be the right one. But if I program all of those 85 molecules into something that can learn from the structures and the failures, then it's going to be able to predict probably better than I can what I should do to make a better structure. So I, I think it's going to be very powerful. It's a little bit scary. I've got a few answers to this, but I'm going to try and keep it to a couple. So uh, in using AI, um, I love it, makes my life more efficient. Mother of two, play lots of sports, rugby, AFL, I need my time. So I love it. It's great for writing those laborious emails that you don't really want to spend time with. Um, for teaching, it's going to make it hard, but I'm going to, I think, collectively um, in our discipline, we're trying to think of out-of-box um, ideas on assessment and just trying to embrace it a bit because I think we're going to need to embrace it at some point. Um, research, uh, I did mention, I haven't, didn't talk about it much, but we're working in the area of microemulsions for electrolytes with a collaborator, Allegro Energy. Um, and microemulsions, they're based with water, oil, and possibly a surfactant, a co-surfactant, and you mix it in and you get this nice clear solution. So something that should be separated isn't as thermodynamically stable, and you get these micelles. And what we did was we threw this in a battery and we got electron transfer quite readily. So it's a water-based electrolyte. And so now we're like, how many microemulsions can we make? Imagine if we had AI to do that. So we're working with collaborators to produce um, a model that we can input some data that we've already collected to try and propose some microemulsion uh, ratios that would give us the battery uh, electrolyte properties that we want. So, yeah, that's... A very long answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, I think it's important to reiterate Kate's point that there's difference between the popular view of AIs like ChatGPT and machine learning. So I think we're very much using machine learning. So in my case, in dealing with large genomic or RNA data sets, uh, you know, millions, billions of data points, and that's where machine learning is most effective. It needs that number of data points. So we're doing that, and um, for Richard's benefit, we've just worked out how to um, use convolutional neural networks, uh, um, which have basically been developed 
based on neural processes for analyzing image data sets like astronomical data sets, etc. But how to, to um, convert non-image data, such as we deal with, into um, quasi-image data so CNNs can work. And that paper's just been accepted. And we're using it to actually try to parse the structures in RNAs that bind particular proteins so we can put some sense into how these molecules work. My quick second comment is that my conviction is that the future of biomedical research, perhaps all biological research, is going to be not the reductionist past, uh, you know, sort of looking at one protein or gene or, um, you know, surface molecule, which is important to get down and dirty, but uh, rather huge data sets. So you imagine you've got millions of genomes in medical research, millions of clinical records, pharmacological records, and most importantly, smart sensor data. And I'm, I'm an advisor for a company in Britain that's got a million Brits signed up with all of their smart sensor data as well as all the other things downloaded from Apple by, by agreement. And this is going to allow us to find patterns in very complex sets of data and track down the, um, the genetic and biochemical physiological basis of complex disorders like neuropsychiatric disorders, arthritis, etc. So uh, and I'm really pushing the federal government to establish data centres in Canberra that are privacy protected, you know, etc., to allow this ecology to evolve. Because I think that the new generation of discoveries is going to be machine learning on these huge data sets that we have to accumulate and then make available for research and ultimately for health translation. And the microphone is over here somewhere. No? Ah. This gentleman. Is it on? Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK. Uh, I have two questions, one for Professor John and another one for Professor Katrina. Uh, the first question is like... No, we can't hear you. <laughs> Wrong. Put the switch up. There's a switch on the side, a little slide that goes up. Not on the black box, on the ah, okay. cylinder of the microphone. Right. No? It takes uh, a second. That's it. Oh. Okay. That's a delay. Yeah, yeah two questions. The first question is for Professor John. Now, the brain structure and the intelligence is completely defined by RNA, or we can go beyond. For example, now physics lo look into particle physics. We have a standard model of particle physics. Uh, now, do we stop from RNA because we are studying biology, or can we further going into the more fundamental level and we can understand the intelligence and the brain structure? That's uh, one question. Uh, the second question is uh, uh, for Professor Katrina. I have a read about... No, like, could you stop a moment? Okay. Can, can you let them answer first because yeah, no definitely. one will remember? Okay, good. <laughs> right. um, so the short answer is no. <laughs> um, particle physics won't help us understand co cognitive processes. Um, and as I was quipping to, I think, Kate earlier, uh, uh, physics won't even explain chemistry. Once you get past two or three atoms, you're, you know, you, you just can't do it. So uh, that's not possible. The data that's coming out is that in nearly all the transactions in the brain, including synaptic uh, um, events, are all RNA mediated. The proteins are the effectors, but the RNAs tell them where to go and when to do it. So it's early days, but there's a terrific group at the University of Queensland doing this and showing a lot of really, they've just looked through a new door and showing all of these RNA transactions happening at synapses during learning. So I think about biology in terms of information more than chemistry. It's transduced by chemistry, but it's the RNA that contains the information and the proteins are, excuse me, biochemists, the dumb effectors of what the RNAs tell them to do. But, but physics is not going to help us understand the brain. Okay, so we'll pass the microphone on. And your second question. Yeah, the second question is, uh, uh, you uh, present something about microtubules. I read a paper about like uh, explaining orchestrated collapse of microtubules ha in the brain has a quantum effect. Uh, so now is Australia focusing on uh, biologic biological inspired quantum mechanics? Uh, is there something uh, in Australia uh, looking into? I don't think I can answer that question. So, I, look, there, there is a lot of quantum uh, physics happening in Australia and it's got a lot of different applications. 
Uh, I think, as Susan said earlier, one of the one of the first things that's going to happen is that quantum uh, computing will be applied to chemistry, um, solving chemical problems. Uh, but I don't know the answer to the biomechanics question. I have a question. Oh, hold on. James. John's got a question. For, ja for James. For, for Richard, sorry. Um, Richard, mm -hmm. um, what you were talking about reminds me very much of a mathematical uh, domain uh, pioneered by Mike Fellows, who used to be at the University of Newcastle, called parametrized complexity, where he said if the system is too complex, too many variables, the search space is too large. And so the only way to search it is to try to work out the subspace, which is going, and maybe that's what you're talking about with Go. Uh, does your approach intersect with parametrized complexity in complex systems, whether it's in biology or, or anywhere else? think. Um, my inclination is to say no. Um, so, so again, the, the focus is, so there are games and there are complicated games and then there are games which describe the semantics of kind of just the very fundamental structures of computation. And those are very simple games. And despite their simplicity, they're very complicated, as you saw. <laughs> I took a game which is just three layers deep. And just getting some understanding of what all those things are, a real understanding of what those things are, is very, very hard. And so somehow, I mean, so the motivation behind this is that before the games, there was still this complicated structure where you could keep asking question upon question upon question up to sort of as many layers deep as you wanted, was there, but people didn't really know how to handle it. And so really what you're trying to do is less, it's less about um, a game which comes from kind of some observed real world system than a game which comes from trying to understand what exactly computation is at some sort of fundamental level. And I guess because of this, you kind of don't really care about complexity because the complexity, if you like, is all in the implementation. And you're not really caring about the implementation. You just want to have a mathematical representation of what this computation is. Hi, this is the final question. Uh, but actually, it has got A and B questions. Professor Katrina. <laughs> um, so you were talking about this protein and these anions uh, you were working on. Um, I'm currently teaching WEA, uh, one course called Life in the Universe. So I'm an astrophysicist, but I'm trying to teach about the li origin of the life um, you know, out on Earth and so on. So I got a very little idea about the cell formation, which has got RNA. Uh, which can be replicated like uh, with DNA, and then it has got protein, and it has got the lipid, which is the membrane. So I know that you are talking about the protein and anion, um, but I also saw some of the uh, form in your one of the slides, which looks like lipid to me, because they have these two legs and one ball. They can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, depending on that, they will be uh, arranging themselves so that they can form that uh, clear membra membrane around the new, uh, RNA and protein. Have you done anything with anion thing uh, with the lipid? Like, is there any connection with that? This is my first question. Then the second question I'll ask right away. You have been <laughs> showing all these um, um, genetical codes and things like, uh, you know, this architecture. It reminds me of, can we also build some X-Men or Hulk or <laughs> Spider-Man at some point with this? Thank you. Yeah, okay, so the first question was about the lipids, and yes, absolutely, we're looking at the, those lipid head groups. The, the cell pictures that I showed at the end of the talk were actually molecules that are binding to the membrane, the, each lipid molecule in the membrane. Um, so yeah, you can, you can look at molecular recognition of all, to, all different types of, of things. They don't have to be anions, they can be cations, they can be neutral molecules as well. The same 
principles apply about finding something that matches the size, the shape, the charge of the species that you're interested in binding to. And your second question, look, I have a, a publication that I use in teaching that shows um, molecular hats on, on, on different stick figures. So the, there's, a, there's an actual publication in the Journal of Organic Chemistry that looks at changing the hats by changing the molecular shape. So yes, absolutely, we can think about building all sorts of things. Thank you.